The Ashanti Region Police says it is maintaining heavy security presence at Osei Tree SHS in Kumasi, where a 19-year-old final year student was killed in a suspected armed robbery attack on Wednesday. Godfrey Arthur was stabbed twice in the neck as he attempted to run away from the armed attackers. Two suspects are said to be in custody and will be speaking to the police in a bit. But news of the attack drove several parents to the school to demand a withdrawal of the awards. Correspondent Mohamed Nouridin visited the school earlier on Thursday and filed the following report. Godfrey Atta, affectionately called Scriptures, was stabbed twice in the neck as he attempted to escape from the suspected robbers. He is said to have bled profusely and left weak and helpless. A student who spoke on a condition of anonymity suggests delay in getting Godfrey to hospital may have caused his sudden death. He says attempts to get one of the teachers to drive the wounded student to hospital in his car proved futile because and it had run out of fuel. Six boys were in the classroom. Two strange men entered and ordered them to surrender their phones, threatening to kill them if they failed to. The students were scared, so they gave their phones out. As the men left, the students shouted, thieves, thieves. Just then, the disease came out of the dormitory heading towards the classroom block to study. He was unaware of what has happened. He bumped into the robbers who stabbed him twice in the neck. He bled profusely, so we took him to our teacher's house to report the incident to him, but he said his car was faulty. We then told the security man who helped us to take him to the hospital. Unfortunately, health personnel told us on arrival he was dead. <laughs> it is about 8 a.m. Thursday. Parents who heard the news had rushed to the school to pick up their wars home. <laughs> Authorities will, however, not allow them in because candidates are writing a paper in ongoing final examinations. Agnes Ousa is board chairman. For so many years, we have been fighting this fence issue. The issue is that it's something that is being contested by some landlords that they bought the land from some chiefs. And this land given to Ukes is gazetted. So we, one finds very difficult to understand why a gazetted land is being sued by some people to other people. So it was even last academic year that we decided that we should start from where there's no litigation. So you see, the frontal part of the school has been fenced now. And we are waiting for the litigation to end. <laughs> God first relatives who have come to the school. Just before authorities spoke to the media, they had asked students to go home and return on Tuesday. Kumasi City Mayor Osei Asibe Entry says steps are being taken to complete the school's fence wall. The school has a very big compound, so the walling is ongoing. They've even written through me to the regional minister and they've also written to the, the minister of education. So all the documentations have been done. The, the authorities are aware of it. We've, we've brought to their attention. And the exercise of walling is also ongoing. So it's rather unfortunate that the walling could not have completed before this thing happened. But you know the thieves, whether there's a wall or no wall, if they have bad intentions, they have a way of mm, going about it. Tafuhine Nana Ajim Frimpong joined other sympathizers to visit the school. He pleaded with parents to exercise patience as authorities investigate the matter. Mahmoud Mohammed Nudi reporting. Tafu Pankrono, Divisional Commander ACP Francis Sopong Agrippa joins us now with an update on the security situation. Thank you uh, for making time, sir. Now, first, tell us about the arrest uh, made in connection with the attack and killing of the student. We're told two persons are in custody. Have there been any more arrests? Uh, come again, come again, I'm not hearing you. All right, um, we're told that two persons have been arrested in connection with this attack at uh, Osei Tree Tree uh, SHS. 
I'm asking if any other arrests have been made. Yeah, it is true that two persons have been arrested. But upon interrogation, uh, the evidence gave, it means they are now assisting police to arrest the main culprit. They are now, I repeat, they are now assisting the police to arrest the main culprit. In other words, uh, in, in other words, you're saying that they're not directly connected to the attack. Uh, per the investigation and per the statement taken, they are not directly in connected with the in connected with the or, 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 or the crime, but they had an information that will lead police for the visible and then uh, for the arrest of the the people. Which two, so pe are, which are two people up. are these? You say? Which two people are you holding right now? Uh, because of the nature of the investigation and the complicity of the investigation, we do not intend to identify them or to bring their identity to the public. Because... Uh, they, 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 they actually knew those people who are committing, those, those who came and committed the offense. And for that matter, we are relying on them uh, for police investigation. So we cannot bring their names and their identity out as of now. Do we know if they are students? Can you tell us that at least? Um, for the purpose of investigation, whether they are students or they are uh, they are not students. Let us hold on to, for for a while, because uh, those who mentioned, I can confirm that uh, we have gotten the names of the people who the perpetrators. But we don't want to preempt the investigation. So, uh, for a sanity to prevail. Let us give them the benefit of the doubt. Now, and it, give us. It, it sounds odd that uh, the armed robbers would attack a school. Do you have any idea what it is that it's sense? Not, it's, it's not an armed robbers. In, uh, if it is in the domain that they are armed robbers, it is wrong. They okay. are not. They are not armed, armed robbers. robbers. They were not armed. Yes, they are not armed, armed, armed robbers. But they killed, they stabbed the boy to death. They were using they a are, weapon. They stabbed the boy to death. What with a, happened with was a that, weapon. What happened was that the, the guy who was stabbed, Confit Atta, uh, uh, he was, because I passed away, I used the was, a final year student. And he was learning Okay. One of the classrooms. You're, you're saying they are not armed robbers, but uh, we're told that he was stabbed. They stabbed the young man to death. They stabbed him with a weapon. The fact that the guy was stabbed doesn't mean that it was armed robbers who raided the school. That's what I'm telling you. I'm saying that Godfrey Atta and other colleagues were learning in one of the classrooms. But those perpetrators, I will call them perpetrators, they went upstairs demanding the phones of the final year student. So when they, they collected few of the final year students' phones, those people over there raised an alarm and they were chasing those the perpetrators who came to the, to the, the top. That is the absence. And when they were descending, this boy who was also learning, innocent person all around. When he had a noise, he wanted to go up to see what is happening. But those perpetrators met him down the stairs there when he was trying to climb the stairs and to free themselves and also to run away from the people who are chasing them from the top. They started uh, stabbing him. The guy was innocent. The guy was uh, 
he doesn't even... A he was ACP, ACP Agrippa, essentially they stabbed him with a knife. They stabbed him with a knife. Thank they you. Him. Now, how so long... After the, we're, we're told that you're maintaining a security presence there. How long would you maintain this presence and what's the purpose? You, you say? We're told that you're maintaining a security presence uh, in the vicinity of the school. How long are you maintaining this presence and for what purpose? As for maintenance of peace and order, it is the mandate of the police. All right. Whether there is an incident or there is no incident, it is the duty of the police to maintain peace and order. Right. Where people's life is at threat. And for that matter, I'm assuring you, we have deployed men, per the instruction of the regional commander, men have been deployed, and we are there to protect the remaining continuous students. Today is the last day for Prophet Atta, who is supposed to write his uh, final paper and go home. Information gathered was that he packed all the bag and baggage from the school, remaining only his uh, hanging bag. So at the end of the paper, he will go home. Yeah. But nobody knows what happened. All right. So what I would like to say yes. is that God knows the best. Thank you very much. ACP Francis Agrippa is the Tafu Pankronut Divisional uh, Police Commander. Moving on, and a Crown High Court trying the suspected killers of Major Maxwell Muhammad Dengtri Obwasi on Thursday was told how his colleagues in the military got to hear of his death. The first witness to be called by the state, the late soldier's deputy, Warrant Officer Class 2 Sabi Kwasi, told the court Major Mahama left the premises of CNG Manning Firm, where they were based in the morning of that fateful day on his usual jog, only for them to be asked to identify his corpse at a morgue later that day. He also talked about how he struggled to keep his colleagues calm when he communicated news of the death to them. There's more in the following report. Warrant Officer Sabi Kwesi, who was Major Mohammed's second in command, was the state's first witness. He was led by Chief State Attorney Evelyn Kelsey to give testimony to the court. It centered on his last engagement with a late soldier before his death, how the soldiers got to know of his death, and the pain they went through to keep the angry soldiers in camp. On the last engagement, he said, I last saw him on the morning of May 29, 2017, when he said he was going for a walk. He told me he will stay long since he was using a different route this time. He told the court as at 2 p.m. on the day, the late soldier whose meal was ready had still not arrived. He simply couldn't reach him. I called his number, but it was just not going through. The warrant officer then informed the court a call from the head of the mining company prompted them that a soldier had been shot. They headed to the Dunkwa hospital where they identified the body. When we got there, I was sure to see that that person who was dead was Captain Mahama, who was lying naked. The warrant officer said he then returned to camp where he prompted his colleagues of the death of their leader. It was tough, he said, to restrain them. I assembled the soldiers and informed them Captain Mahama was dead. They were very annoyed, but I pleaded and we all stayed in camp. That marked the end of the soldier's testimony. Two objections were raised in the course of the testimony, both bordered on references to phone calls the soldier received from a commander at Stakradi and another from the head of the mining company they were protecting. The trial judge overruled the objections, dismissing concerns it amounted to hearsay. Defense lawyer George Bernard Shaw has started cross-examining the state's witness. Hearing continues on May 24. Elton. 13 suspected criminals, including a female, have been arrested by police at Mankesim. The suspects were found with substances suspected to be Indian hemp and other items the police suspect may have been stolen. The Mankesim Division of Police Command says the suspects might be part of a criminal syndicate that is fleeing Kaswa because of the incessant tubes carried out there recently. ACP Award Hene AJ Champong addressed the media after the operation. During the market days, you see them coming down. And then we have noticed their movement also. You know, chiefs, sometimes they, according to their movement, you can identify them. 
because they think somebody they might have uh, stolen something from him is chasing him. So normally when they are working, you see their mannerism. They will pause, stand somewhere, and then be looking at, at areas and see whether somebody is after them. The foreign items suspected to have been stolen. 20 assorted mobile phones. Honda motor bike with registration number M17GL419. One article TV set. One speaker box. Three video decks. And also a quantity of dry leaves suspected to be Indian him. Suspects were detained for screening and attempts retrieved are retained for evidential purposes. We are going to continue because uh, we have seen the trend that uh, that is what they are doing. They operate at the Kaswa and then run to this place. And we don't want the division to get a bad name or become a hard out whereby people will go and do their own thing and then come and hide themselves here. No. So we are doing all possible means and measures have been put in place to curtail all these minas. And again, I am appealing to the public that uh, they should disclose vital information to us so that we can combat it. Yes. We're taking a break here on Join News Prime, but still ahead in the bulletin. Government rejects claims of a shortage of maize in the country, but admits prices have shot up. But also in the bulletin, we get to speak with a doctor who reattached the severed hand of a factory worker who got it chopped off in a workplace accident after an incredible eight-hour surgery at the Kolobu Teaching Hospital. Normal for me would mean that he would have be able to carry out his regular daily functions, eat with his hand, take care of himself, wear his own clothes, ironing. So within three to four months, if he follows a physiotherapy protocol, he should be. We have those stories still to come in the bulletin section. Now, the Ministry of Food and Agriculture has categorically rejected all claims of a maize shortage in Ghana. It follows complaints by poultry farmers and traders about the unavailability of the commodity on the market. Government, however, admits there's been a hike in prices, but maintains it is not because of a shortage of maize. Join News Northern Region correspondent Hashmin Mohammed spoke with Al Haji Moro, who deals in grains at the Tamale Abuabo market. The back of maize is 130 Ghana cities now. By some of the traders are selling it at 140 because when they came to us, they buy for 130 and go at maybe Bamboom or Casalago because of the transportation matter. Then they sell it at 140. Then. Now we are selling 130. 130. Yeah. Now previously, uh, as at April, how much was a bag of? Means. Um, as I have price 110 Ghana cities, one will be selling. And then, because of the demand higher this time, and then the price has shoot up after 130. Is it that we don't have enough maize in the market, or what has accounted for it? Uh, we still have maize, but because of the demand, as I now, down south people are coming more to buy. So, because of the demand higher and then the supply is less. So that's why the prices are going up. And we're still expecting the price to be high because of um, when you see the new coming uh, nut, it's about three months later we can get the new ones. Then now the demand is high, so people are coming to request. Because of that, the prices should be shipped up again. Let's now speak with the Deputy Minister of Food and Agriculture, George Drone, uh, government's take on the reported shortage of maize. Good evening to you, sir. You had the Hi, grains sir. dealer in Tamale who says there's a shortage of maize, but as far as you're concerned, this is false. Please explain. 
good evening, sir. Uh, what I understand is I don't think there's a shortage. There's no shortage. The only pro challenge that we are having is the price hike. But the farmers and those who have the maize are waiting for the price to go up. That's normally what happens at this season. In every year between March, April, May, is a planting season. So that is what normally happens. So there's no shortage. It's only the price hike. All right. Granted, are you going to allow the this this price hike and the speculation to continue? No, 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 not at all. If that happens, it's going to affect all of that. All right. Especially those in the poultry industry. It's going to affect their, their, their business. So, so what, what has been done about do, it? Yeah, what we need to do is to go, to, uh, especially in the north there. I know people who have them. Some have them in their houses. They are not willing to release them. So you have to engage them and see the way forward. Rather than that, there will be a problem. All right. If, if these people have it in their homes and they are refusing to release them, how about the buffer stock company, which is supposed to have stored a lot of maize and could also release them? Definitely. But I've not been to the buffer stock office yet. Tomorrow, I spoke to your colleague this afternoon. Tomorrow, I'll go to the office and check their, level, their, their stock level and see what we can do. Because they have, they, they have some as well. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy uh, Minister of Agriculture, George Odro. We have the Buffer Stock Company uh, on the line and uh, we're speaking to them uh, right now. Uh, so you've heard uh, the, the, the challenge being ex ex uh, experienced by poultry farmers and traders. Uh, how is the Buffer Stock Company resolving this issue? Good evening to your cherished listeners. Yes, uh, Mr. Hanan Abdul Wahab. I, I'm asking. I can hear you. I hear you now. Yes, I'm asking. What is the? Let's first start with the stocks of grain that you have. Do you have enough? We have uh, lost uh, the chief executive of the Buffer Stock Company there. Hopefully, we can get to bring him back. But now, Joy News uh, produced a series of reports warning of a possible maize shortage following the fall and worm invasion. Here's a report my colleague Justice Bedu filed from the northern region town of Bimbela in October last year. In this land, there is uncertainty. This time of the year should be the major harvest season, and yet there is very little to take home. Wumbe Al Hassan has spent nearly 2,000 cities cultivating this 10 acre farm over the last six months. Now, all the days of hard work has been brought down by the fall army worms. <laughs> Life is not normal again. There is hunger looming. How are we going to feed ourselves? How are we going to feed our families? Like Wumbe, hundreds, possibly thousands of farmers share similar stories of loss and pain. Since March this year, the pests have invaded nearly 120,000 hectares of farmland. Government pledged a fight back with its pesticide control program. That intervention, it seems, failed to trickle down to the people who needed it the most. Ascension officers here are, inad uh, are woefully inadequate. One officer will be taking, let's say, 20, 25 communities. He cannot pass the information. Malnutrition resulting from a lack of food is already causing enough havoc. It is responsible for up to a third of all childhood deaths in Ghana now. One in every five children is now stunted. This part of Ghana, already one of the country's poorest, is also the most affected. It is the reason why any further shortage in food resulting from this invasion could be grave. Well, that report by Justice uh, Beidou filed uh, from the northern region town of Bimbela in October last year was just to indicate that there could be the possibility of this maize shortage 
that we're hearing, but the government is saying that there's no May shortage. Let's get on the phone lines again and speak with the Buffer Stock Company about the challenge being experienced by poultry farmers and traders and how it is resolving it. Mr. Hanan Abdul Wahab is the Chief Executive of the Buffer Stock Company. Good evening, good evening to you uh, once again, uh, Mr. Uh, Wahab. Now, what is the situation with the maize stocks you have at the Buffer Stock Company? Thank you very much. The National Food Buffer Stock Company has some volume of maize in our company warehouses across the country. Some of these stores are being supplied to all second cycle institutions under the Free Senior High School program. And such strategic stocks are Yes, sir, we're listening. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. What I'm saying is that the National Food Buffer Stock Company has some volume of maize in the company's warehouses across the country, and some of which these stocks are being supplied to the free senior high school. All right, we've just spoken with the Deputy Minister of uh, Food and Agriculture, George Odro, and he is saying that there's no shortage of maize. I'm sure you'd agree that there's no shortage. But the issue he is saying is that there are some people who are holding on or hoarding the maize and uh, hoping that the prices will go up so then they can release. But the intervention of the buffer stock company would be to release some of these stocks so that uh, whatever speculative activity they are engaged in will come to naught so that the prices can come back down. Is this something that you will do? Thank you very much. Uh, let me give this clarification. There is no need to early fears of Ghanaians that there is food shortage. Although I had a poultry farmer on one of your sister stations claiming that uh, they have no means to feed their beds. It is not exactly the case that means is in short supply in the country. Poultry farmers' inability to assess means is not an indication of food insecurity in the country. All right. Mr. Wahab, we're not talking just about uh, poultry farmers. We're speaking with traders. We spoke to Alaji Moro, who's a trader. Uh, at the, he's a grains dealer at the Tamale market, and he confirms that, yes, there's, uh, they are not getting the grains, and prices are going up. I'm asking, what does the National uh, Buffer Stock Company intend to do about it? Are you going to do anything the about National it? National Buffer Stock Company is a company that is under the Ministry of Food and Agriculture. Our primary responsibility is to mop up excess grains from farmers by providing them with minimum guarantee price. Minimum guarantee price is arrived at by getting the crop market analysis of that particular year. We have done that. All right. I want to believe that as part of your responsibilities, when there, there's a, a, a shortage or seeming shortage, or there appears to be speculative uh, activity around the grain, you may want to release some of the grains so that the prices would stabilize. Yes, that is part of our mandate. So will and you do that? Speak, as we speak now, the volumes we have is what I've indicated to you earlier that we are supplying to the free senior high school. So we are anticipating that. You see, when you look at what is happening now, it is, it is, it, it is a trend over, the, over, over five years now. When it gets to this period, before we go into production, farmers are holding on to their maize anticipating price increment somewhere June, July. So it is something that has been happening. You understand? The stock we have currently, our primary aim now is to make sure that the free senior high school students get their maize requirements. And currently, trucks are supplying maize to the second cycle institution across the country. So poultry farmers are situations and traders in, 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 in Tamale who are claiming the shortage, they are the same people. You see, when you look at the traders, when you look at the grain industry, the traders in the market are the same people who buy from farmers and keep 
anticipating price increment. Okay, let, let me just uh, put it to you one, one more time. From what you're telling me, you, you don't have any interest at all in releasing grains to foil the speculative activity on the market right now? Not that we don't have any interest, but what I'm saying is that the stock that we have is it's, it's not the enough for the free senior high school. It's not enough to do that. Is that what you're saying? It's not enough to release and stabilize the prices. All up. right. Yes, uh, making, uh, make, making us to believe that there is a uh, shortage of meat in the system. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Hanan Abdul Wahab. He's the chief executive of the Bafa Stock Company. You're watching Join News Prime. We're taking a break. We're bringing you business news. And uh, in business news, we're also telling you about the fact that it is now possible for you to send mobile money from your network to another network. And it doesn't have to be on the same network. And we'll be telling you all about that in business news station. Good evening to you. It's now time for business. Vice President Dr. Mahmoudou Baumia says Ghana will become a PayPal-compliant country by the second quarter of 2019, following its agreement with international payment systems a few weeks ago. The Vice President stated this when he launched the first phase of the mobile money interoperability system in Accra. He assured that with the current integration going on, the financial inclusion agenda by government will be achieved. The international payment system has been operating as a platform for sending remittances to the Europe, US and other parts of the world. The return into Ghana of PayPal can be described as a dream come true for the government as it hopes to improve financial inclusion across the country in both formal and informal sectors. Speaking at the official launch of the mobile money interoperability system, Vice President Dr. Mahamudu Baumia disclosed that based on some discussions with the international company, they have agreed to enter Ghana's financial service industry by the second quarter of next year. This, he said, will enhance transparency in the mobile financial markets. In this regard, I'm also happy to announce that Ghana has con concluded discussions with PayPal, and Ghana will therefore, if all goes well, become one of the PayPal-compliant countries in two phases. According to the roadmap presented by PayPal, by the second half of 2019, which is next year, Ghanaian merchants should be able to receive payments for their goods sold online. By the first half of 2020, Ghanaian consumers would be able to make payments for goods and services purchased online by the PayPal accounts. It is now up to us, the Bank of Ghana gives banks, fintechs, telcos, and merchants to make this happen within the time frame, and also to prepare ourselves for the opportunities it presents. I will ask Gibbs to put together a working group of stakeholders to work to implement this roadmap. This presents exciting opportunities for Ghana, and we should take full advantage of it. The Vice President also mentioned that the mobile interoperability system will be fully operational when the EaseWitch card is linked to the bank accounts and mobile money wallets. We, however, have two more aspects of interoperability that we have to complete in the next two months. And this is what we call the second phase. So phase two of interoperability will complete the financial inclusion triangle. Because the triangle is to make sure that e-switch, mobile accounts, and bank accounts, that those form the triangle, e-switch, mobile accounts, and bank accounts, that you have a seamless interoperability between the three. That is where we want to move. So phase two of the interoperability platform will complete the financial inclusion triangle by allowing the movement of monies between and among telcos, banks, and e-switch accounts in a seamless manner. Mobile money interoperability is a service that allows direct and seamless transfer of funds from one mobile money wallet to another across networks. Away from that, a subsidiary of Quantum Group, Quantum Terminals, which is also the logistics wing of the group, has revealed plans to invest 52 million Ghana cities in the construction of an LPG recirculation plant. This comes after the company listed on the Ghana Stock Exchange today.
The Petroleum Company has issued a 45 million CD 10 year corporate bond on the Ghana Stock Exchange, a first tranche of a 140 million bond program by the company. Quantum Terminals is hoping its listing on the Ghana Stock Exchange will allow the company to expand its tank farm. Executive Director of Quantum Terminals, Emmanuel J. Mensah, explained that the company is awaiting government's acceptance of its proposal. The next level after this is a building of the refilling plants where we intend to invest $52 million to build the refilling plants in, in the three locations, at Wabo, in Tema, and in Kumasi, just so um, we can support the government objective of moving us to the cylinder recirculation system. Because you know that is much safer than the, than the model we are operating now. We have submitted a proposal to government. Um, and government is looking at it, but we believe we have the right capacity to qualify, and we believe we'll get a license to do that. Meanwhile, the managing director of the Ghana Stock Exchange, Kofi Yamwa, urged management of Quantum to ensure it runs its operations smoothly so it does not miss out on its investor confidence. You came raise funds for a specific purpose. From the prospectors, these funds are mainly going for expansion of your tank farm and working capital. The market wants to abide, wants you to abide by this so that we can build investor confidence going forward. And number two is this market depends on information. So we want you to be up and doing as far as all price sensitive information that will come your way is concerned. We want you to feed the market with all price sensitive information so that we can build investor confidence in your security and also in the market. Quantum Terminals is the first non-financial institution to issue a corporate bond on the Ghana fixed income market. Reporting for Joy Business, Karen Dodo. Now, a team of experts judging business ideas from participants of the Cosmos Innovation Center Architect Challenge say they are impressed with the pitches. The first competitive pitch event saw 19 teams presenting solutions they wish to provide to resolve some challenges within the agriculture value chain. My colleague Adelaide Arthur witnessed the presentations and our report. The ideation team were presented with innovative business ideas that sought to link farmers to aggregators and processors, provide crop and fish farmers with vital information that will enhance production and access to credit, as well as help farmers to control pests and enrich soil. The panel of judges, drawn from the agribusiness sector in academia, had this to say about the agribusiness ideas presented. In order to have you know, innovations that will stand the test of time and make an impact in the sector, you have to understand the contextual or the cultural experiences of agriculturalists within the economy. And this group seems to have a good handle of that. And of course, that's also attributable to the fact that they have very, very diverse individuals, you know, uh, um, mentors and then people who are actually specializing in the agricultural sector on their teams helping them. Apart from producing the pest traps which we already have, we are going to be introducing Nella and Ernestina who want to start a pest control company called FarmCure are satisfied with their performance and are confident they will proceed to the next stage of the competition. Today's pitch has also um, increased my um, hopes a lot because we really had a good feedback. That is also another. And then we have a unique product that we are bringing up on the market, which, is, which will be very unique to the Ghanaian um, community as a whole. So I'm very positive. The ideation team, they have no choice. I mean, they, they just have no choice but to, but to you know, side with us on honestly, this. Yeah, yeah and You also feel the same? Yes, they have no like, choice. They, they really have, like, because there was no problem with all I pitched today. Yes. And we have a good product. So if you are counting the pitches, the products, I think we are top notch. Cosmos Energy is also excited about the progress the young entrepreneurs are making. Vice President and Country Manager Joe Mensa says the Cosmos Innovation Center Agritech Challenge is focusing on agriculture because of its value to the nation. KIC, when uh, we developed it, was to find a way to engage the youth and have them do something sustainable. We just happened to 
chance on picking agriculture as the first sector because it has been the mainstay of the country and uh, everybody's seen the impact. Over the past two years, you've, you've invested in sex startups, and I understand the amount was 50,000 US dollars. This year, will there be an increase? Do you plan to increase, or it's just going to be the same amount? To be honest with you, when we, our, our philosophy was to just handle two companies. So the first year, we picked two. The second year, they were all so good that other entities wanted to be part of it. So Cosmos is actually funding two, and then the other you know, two have been funded by other companies, a total of six. And I'm pretty sure that with the quality that we're seeing today and the sort of collaboration and calls that we are receiving from other entities, we are very sure that we will be able to push more through. Judges are scoring the teams who will be told in the next few days whether or not they will be eliminated or make it to the next stage. Adelaide Arthur. Joy News, Accra. And away from that, business leaders from Ghana and Nigeria have met at the Maiden Gangeria Conference to explore ways of deepening bilateral trade between the two economic powers in West Africa. Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Ubaumia called on Nigeria to open up its economy to more liberal trade ties. Charles IT reports. The Vice President, Dr. Mahmoud Bamia, was addressing the maiden edition of Gangera Rising 2018 conference in Accra. He said Ghana and Nigeria would have to speed up trade collaborations to achieve mutual economic growth. Nigeria will remain an important country and friend, and our government will make the utmost effort to continue to create a supporting environment for Nigerian home businesses to grow and thrive. And let us build and strengthen platforms for engagements between the private sector and governments. On behalf of His Excellency, the President, Nana Adodan Kwa and on behalf of the people of Ghana, I once again say to our brothers and sisters from Nigeria, welcome to Ghana. Please spread the word around. We are open for business. We are open to create wealth. We are open for risk takers and innovative thinkers, young and old. We are open to expand opportunities for inclusive growth so we can create jobs, improve livelihoods and tackle poverty. The conference discussed various initiatives by both governments to address the barriers of trade, business and investment climates in the two countries and propose ways to accelerate them. The vice president said he believes both governments must leverage the positive economic indicators of their respective countries in new trade partnerships. We should do something among ourselves better. We should move the economy of the two countries, which is the engine power of the economic community of West Africa, to a higher line. We discuss in conferences, we take the same stand in the international community. Nigerian Ghana's in peace and keep, um, peacekeeping operation is treated so hard, but we are not doing so well. Nigeria diversifies a lot, just like the last speaker spoke about. We all have both agri business climate system situations. Nigeria currently produces about 80% to 85% of the rice we consume in Nigeria. In the last two or three years, we used to have just about 34 million rice farmers. Currently, we have about 12 million rice farmers in Nigeria. When you want to talk in terms of millet, we are second to the US. To sorghum, we are third to India. In terms of yam and cassava, we are the best in the world. So where are we sitting down and we are not doing a lot among ourselves? So I don't want us, to, at the end of this conference, to come in with a lot of MOU, with a lot of agreement, with a lot of theory, a lot of Google information on the internet. Pour it upon ourselves and nothing will happen. I think we move to, move to a platform where we can do business together and move the two economies to a greater height. Meanwhile, Nigerian High Commissioner to Ghana, Olufemi Abikoye, blamed the poor trade collaboration between Ghana and Nigeria on what he describes as a lack of trust between both countries. The High Commissioner says both countries are losing billions of dollars in trade to other powerful countries like China. The 
Ghana Nigeria conference also comes in the wake of growing concerns regarding the protectionist approach that the Nigerian economy takes on when it comes to trade ties between neighboring countries, as well as specific impediments to trade liberalization agreements between Ghana and Nigeria. I'm Charles Aite in Accra. And that's all by way of business tonight. My name is Imano Apuachi. We have a the small news coming up. Don't go away. Now into a very good news story. It is easy to assume that some medical conditions are hopeless with no chance of recovery. So when the hand of factory worker Victor Atipo was completely chopped off by a sawmill he was working on, it would not have been far-fetched to conclude that such a hopeless situation had arisen. Victor has, however, was however rushed to the hospital where after an eight-hour surgery, his hand was reattached. Doctors are calling this a rare occurrence. Daniel Dazi visited the Kolibu Teaching Hospital where the surgery took place and reports. I'm sure you are familiar with the ladies' access we call the handbag. A handbag was used in this very premises a few weeks ago, but I'm not speaking about something to keep your lipstick or your, your accessories in. I'm speaking of a plastic bag which carried a human hand, literally. A factory worker here in Accra had his hand severed off by a sawmill and he came to the hospital, to the Kolebu Teaching Hospital where we are now, after he had visited the Lekma Hospital and the 37 Military Hospital, carrying his hand wrapped in a plastic bag and the hand of course lying in ice. Thankfully, he left the hospital a few weeks later after a successful surgery with his hand fully attached. The acting medical director for the National Reconstructive Plastic Surgery and Burn Center at the Kolobu Teaching Hospital, Dr. Kwame Daku, explains how the surgery was carried out. Basically for these cases, what we are looking at is repairing the bone. The bone must be fixed. Once that is done, we need to repair the tendons. We also need to repair the nerves for sensation and we also need to repair the blood vessels for blood supply before we come to stitching muscles and skin. So each of these must be done in a particular way. Each of these must be prepared in a particular way. He commends staff of the Lekma Hospital and the 37 Military Hospital for enabling the speedy referral of the patient. From the point at which the injury occurred, the gentleman was sent to Lekma within 30 minutes. And within two hours of the incident, the gentleman was here in Kolibu through 37 and uh, within four hours we were able to get him into theatre and begin the surgery which eventually uh, ended about eight hours after we started to put his hand back on his arm. He also gives some advice on what to do when an extremity is cut off. If this does happen anywhere, be it in your house, in a factory, by the roadside, you may not know what, is salvage, what we can salvage and what we cannot salvage, but um, you must transport it to us in the appropriate way which is basically picking up the extremity, the digit or the hand or whatever it may be, wrap it in a bag or handbag as you were putting earlier, and place this bag on ice or in ice. You do not put the ice or water directly on the, the severed extremity. You destroy some cells and they will not be able to repair it. So once you do that, um, all would be well. For Joy News, Daniel does it. Residents in the southern part of the Volta region on Thursday protested against plans by government to explore crude oil in a huge landmass straddling a number of regions including Volta and known as the Voltaian Basin. The protesters are worried the fish stock will be depleted once exploration starts and they will be deprived of the age-old fishing trade they have depended on. In a petition presented to the municipal chief executive of the Keta municipality, Set Yoma U, the protesters demanded a stop to plans by government to explore the crude oil in the area. Let's hear some of them. A lot of experience. Some of us have been to Niger Delta before, and uh, but it was devastating. We don't want that sort of thing to come here. These are people 
people who are around here have never traveled, some who don't know, they really don't want it. The youth, we are thinking of the youth, the future of the youth. Oil is a diminishing factor. It will get finished after some years. But after it's, they have done the havoc, the land is destroyed, the lagoon is destroyed. It will be a lot of things come back again. That will be a lot of work to us. And if we are farmers, we are fishermen. The moment they start drilling, there will be restrictions. You cannot go to fishing. The land is polluted, the water is the, the, the underground water which we use very much for our crops. Well, Mr. Yom, the Ketta MC, Mr. Yomvu, received the petition from the protesters promising to forward it to the president. You know that our people are farmers and fishermen. <laughs> so they are saying that the land that they are coming to do onshore oil drilling in our area. So they are saying that if they are coming to do that, it will affect their farmlands and then their, their lagoons. So because of that, they are protesting to send their grievances to the presidency. Right. Beyond sending the grievances to the president, what appropriate response would you give these people? But what happened is that uh, they have presented the petition. What I need to, to do is to forward to the, uh, the presidency for attention. So I have assured them that we are going to look at it. And then at the end, I know we are listening to government. The authorities will come on and come on with whatever they want to do for the area. Right. Would you say that the the concerns raised by the people are founded? They have basis. Please come again. I'm asking. Would you say mm. that the concerns raised by these people, whom you live with, in your municipality, are founded? Oh, actually, I will, uh, actually I can also say that maybe they have some issues outside their. Well, we have received a statement from the Energy Ministry, which uh, we are going to be sharing with you. It says, uh, we appeal to the residents of Keta that government will take their concerns into consideration in determining areas where petroleum activity can take place. The Petroleum Act 919 defines the process of, for opening an area, including the need for consultations and giving opportunity to interested parties the right to petition the minister against opening an area for oil activity. If this was not done in 2016 before opening the area and awarding the right to exploration, that was an anomaly. We will engage with the community and find a workable solution to this. Government wants to exploit the petroleum resources of our country, but in doing this, we will be very responsible to ensure that the legitimate concerns of our people are not compromised. Hope this helps to clarify. In other news, Chief Justice Sophia Kufu is giving the WA Municipal Assembly six months to construct a new court for the WA district or face closure of the court. She expressed shock and disbelief upon seeing the poor state of the court during a tour there. The Chief Justice says the new court to be built should be befitting of a district court. Rafiq Salam reports from WA. The Chief Justice is on a three day official tour of the Upper West Region to see for herself the state of the courts in the region with a view to finding solutions to the challenges they are grappling with. Her first point of call was the Ward District Court where she was appalled at the conditions there. More than half of the courtroom is covered with lockers and broken tables and chairs, some of which have crooked stands. The only thing that seemed to be in good condition at this court is the judge's seat. The magistrate's chamber Registry and other ancillary offices are located at the regional administration block B, which is about 150 meters away. Here is the World District Magistrate, Sidney Brima, interacting with the Chief Justice, Sophia Ikufu, on the challenges they grapple with on a daily basis. 
We have to separate control. Yes, separate and, and, and separate yes. Uh, chambers. Yes. So yeah, we are in three spots. Two, two places. We, the registry of the chambers are the the mm -hmm. registry. And we need to walk every morning to the mm -hmm. courtroom. And that's courtroom. what we've been talking yes. about. That's yes. it's unacceptable. Your week. And you cover how many districts? Three. Three districts. Yes. Actually, one district. <laughs> I think I made that. I made that a long time ago. That's according to the law. <laughs> the chief justice, after inspecting the courtroom, expressed shock at the state of the World District Court and directed the one municipal chief executive, Alaji Isakutai Mumin, to construct a new court building before the end of the year. Failure to do that will lead to the closure of the World District Court. We will have to agree on the time. Because by the end of the six months, I want to see that there's activity for the permanent court building. To me, this is going to be a, a we will keep referring to it as the temporary locations. It, it doesn't have to be in the, on this spot. Find a good spot where we will have adequate parking, adequate water, power, uh, and then you make sure that there's a proper demarcation. This is the court. The one municipal chief executive is Sakutai Ruharaba back for more time. Mm -hmm. As soon as possible, uh, we'll do what we can do. But a six months uh, period we gave, I want to uh, to appeal so that we make that more flexible. But we try to do what we can do uh, humanly possible uh, to get the court room for them. The situation at the Waseku and High Courts were not different. Broken chairs and tables leads the waste list of the court officials. But these and other challenges will be solved if an abandoned edifice that should be the High Court complex is completed. It was started some 13 years ago and is moving at a snail's pace. Chief Justice Sophia was not impressed with the state of the course in the one municipality. We don't even have any premises built as court. A new region has been, in, it's been a region for a long time. The Chief Justice earlier paid courtesy calls on the overlord of the Wala Kingdom, now for Saint Saint the Pelipo the Fourth, at his palace, and the Deputy Appellate Regional Minister Amid Chinia Isaku at the Regional Coordinating Council. Reporting for J News, Rafik Salam. Wa. The Speaker of Parliament, Professor Michael Quay, has reiterated his position that he will not preside over discussions to pass any legislation that endorses gay rights. This is not the first time the Speaker has expressed his reservations about promoting gay rights in Ghana. In an interview with Paul Adomotri, host of Good Evening Ghana, the Speaker said if pressure mounts on him from Cabinet to preside over the promotion of gay rights, he will be left with no choice than to resign his position as Speaker of Parliament. I will not preside over this. You see, there is a time when a man or a woman must be guided by some principles. So in that circumstance you would leave Oh, if, if it happens, mm -hmm. and I know it will not happen, because we are, we are in Ghana. But if it happens? If it should happen, yes. just by way of conjecturing, yes. I will leave. You leave the speaker's I will not chair. preside over that. No. Mm. I will not preside over that. And I will not be part of that. It will be a matter of serious principle, including my Christian ideals. You know, I've told you, homosexuals, Ghanaians recognize them as also having rights. Like thieves. So we don't have like, to be them up here. You already made that yes. point. So now, it, it, it must show you that their perception is not a fraud. And I'm so confident about the Ghanaian position from the point of view of social research. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to bringing a book out a book on this mm. because look at some but how young come? man mm. as, as uh, professor as Alston, i don't know how old he is mm. you know making such remarks that me deluded over that matter if anybody should bring such a thing in, the, in, in, in parliament and i have to preside over that i would rather resign than uh, subscribe to this delusion <laughs> 
Now, cats on fingers and waist pains are common among garret makers, especially in rural areas. These women use nails to make holes in metal sheets in order to make it greater that takes endless hours to mash a pan of cassava. There is now a new a solution as the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology has been producing energy efficient mini cassava grater. On Tech Thursday, Lava Firm's Kwesi Deborah has been speaking with the engineer behind the innovation, Deborah Pando of the Technology Consultancy Center of the University. Regina Yevunu of Adumkrum in the Ashanti region has just returned from farm. She's peeling off the cassava she brought. Rusty but working, a big girl latte grits the pieces. The agaru makers, this type of homemade grater they call grater from tin can, has been used for decades. We use nails and wood to manufacture the grater, she says. Sometimes grating can lead to bruises and cuts on the fingers. We feel waist pains after every session. A study published in the Journal of Agroelementary Processes and Technologies 2012 found corrosion stands as a major source of food contamination. And this is due to the migration of metallic particles. Deborah Pando of the Technology Consultancy Center of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology set out to find a solution. She started working on a mini cassava grater five years ago as part of her master's thesis. So I worked on the tooth size and the tooth space and the angle at which the teeth has to be and how to make a jig so that the teeth is formed and is very uniform and to promote interchangeability of the teeth and to help to get a better quality of um, mash when you grate the cassava for gairi. The mini cassava grater can process 200 kilograms cassava per hour. It is made of stainless steel which makes it safe. Since gairi needs very little processing after it's made, so you have to make sure that um, what you make is good enough, it's clean, you do not use other things or non unsafe materials for the part. This motor that powers the whole machine is just 0 0.75 horsepower. Back at the Dumkrum, Regina and Debbie Girl deployed the mini cassava grater for their work. They are happy the hard, strenuous days are over. Benjamin Te Kwame is assembly member for the area. Now the women don't complain of difficulties. The mini cassava grater is helping people of over 30 rural communities. The project, which is in collaboration with the Orlin College in the United States, focuses on affordable food processing machinery in deprived communities. Professor Samuel Saki is director of the Technology Consultancy Center. Uh, the next stage of the collaboration uh, is going to focus on how to scale up the production. For Joy News, Kwesi Debra, Lava Firm, Kumasi. Right, so there's one more story before we bring you Join Us Interactive. And Wamara is a word that set her apart from other contestants in the 11th edition of the National Script Spelling Bee Competition. Shifa Amankwa Gabe of Nagi's Angel School in Kumasi will represent Ghana and Africa at this year's World Contest in Washington, D.C. As the country looks forward to the ultimate global prize, she is leaving no stone unturned in a quest to bring glory to Ghana at the end of the global championship. Chrissy Debra. Shifa emerged national champion, the first ever from Ashanti region in the final contest held in Accra. 
She is hopeful ongoing preparation will put her in a good stead to make her country proud by annexing the global crown. After a meeting with the United States Consulate, Shefa paid the courtesy call on a Santihe, Utu Fosei to the second at Mensha Palace. She is confident blessing from the king and other well wishes will help her bring the trophy to Ghana. The fact that I'm the only representative from Ghana, we're representing in the Scripps National Spelling Bee, I want to put in my best to bring pride to Ghana and Africa. And me being the only representative from Ghana and Africa at large, I want to put in my best to bring pride to Africa and Ghana. Loku Renju, an organizer of the competition, the Young Educators Foundation, was granted permission to hold the inauguration of the next national contest at the Mensha Palace. Chief Executive Eugenia Mawina Ajua Techimensen led the delegation. The Asante Hene himself has education very dear to his heart, and uh, we were very impressed with the way he received us and how he encouraged not just Shifa but all children to aspire not just in spelling but in all aspects of education. So we thought that this will be the best place to launch the 12th edition um, of the Spelling Bee which will be in uh, September of this year. Sponsors Indomie Instant Noodles and Najis Angel School were represented. Reporting for Joy News, Kwesi Debra. And in the headlines, Ashanti Region Police beef up security at Senior High School in Kumasi, where a 19-year-old final year student was killed in a suspected armed robbery attack. Two suspects are in custody, assisting the police with investigations. High Court in Accra hears chilling account of how colleagues of the late Major Maxwell Mahama in the military got to know of his death last year at the Central Region town of Ding Chobwasi. The government rejects claims of a shortage of maize in the country but admits prices have shot up. In business, Quantum Terminal, the logistics subsidiary of Quantum Group, becomes first non-financial institution to issue corporate bond on the Ghana fixed income market.